All right. Well, thank you again for joining here today. I know that end of the calendar year, it's always a busy time. It certainly is for us here at Jamf, and we know it is for you joining us from around the world. So we're going to dive right in. My name is Garrett, part of the product team here, specifically responsible for Jamf Pro, and we have a ton of ground to cover today. Now, our webinar is slotted for 30 minutes, and I do want to leave time on the back end for Q&A. So make use of that questions panel in GoToWebinar. As I'm talking, as we're working through uh, some of the things on this agenda slide, fire off a question in that question panel in real time. We'll be sure to circle back at the end and do all of our questions in Q&A at that point. So a quick Jamf overview to begin here, specifically if you're brand new. You know, if this is your first webinar, your first time joining us here to learn about Jamf, this will be a great opportunity to both learn about the core product, Jamf Pro, but also how we've grown. And, you know, over the past 12 or even 24 months, Jamf has really gone through a massive evolution. You look at this slide in Jamf Pro in the center here, it used to be called Casper Suite, of course, a number of years ago, but now the Jamf Pro 10 series is really the gold standard for managing Apple in enterprise and education. But layered on top of that are some of the acquisitions we've made over the last 18 months. And so that top row, Jamf Connect, is really how we connect the Apple ecosystem together. The middle part of this uh, graph, or even a sandwich, if you will, is managing Apple devices at scale. Jamf Now, Jamf Pro, Jamf School, depending on your environment and needs, helps you manage Apple at scale. And our newest offering, Jamf Protect, rolling out uh, just a couple of weeks ago, protecting Apple, purpose-built for Mac, and that is important. We'll circle back on that later. Now, wrapped around all of this is the Jamf Nation. If you go to jamfnation.com, if you've never been before, more than 100,000 fellow Apple IT admins waiting there today to engage, to talk, to learn, to network so jump on Jamf Nation. It's free, and you do not need to be a Jamf customer. So as you can see, Jamf has really grown in the past year or so with those acquisitions, with some new things we've built internally. One thing I want to call out, though, is something we've been talking about for years, eight-plus years now, and that's day zero support. And even as we've added new products to the Jamf family and acquired companies and really seen this thing grow as demand has grown for Jamf products, We've remained true to this core promise, and this is something we started promising to you back in 2012, and we've nailed this every year ever since. It's the promise that when Apple releases a new operating system, and that could be Mac OS, iOS, uh, this year brand new, of course, iPad OS, uh, or TV OS as well, that on release day, when that operating system is released, the minute, the second it's available, Jamf Pro is ready to go. And since 2012, we have been. And we've given you two options. And this is really important, especially in medium to large size organizations, because you've got that critical mass where things get really interesting around operating system upgrade time. And kind of two paths appear. Path one is a lot of your staff is excited about the new OSs, right? And they want that new feature. Maybe you want that new security thing that's coming as a part of the new Mac OS uh, Catalina operating system or iOS 13, right? And we want to get those out into the hands of end users as fast as possible. Well, with Jamf Pro, we can enable that. We can deploy new operating systems on release day in a very efficient and streamlined way. But the second path, I think, is equally as interesting. And that's where you say, uh, pump the brakes just for a minute here. A couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, we want to take some time to test and validate these new operating systems before we launch them for our global teams. And that's super common. I was just talking to a company a couple of months ago in their office about this, and they said, look, we have way too much that's dependent upon our operating systems. So if we push an upgrade, let's say we go to Catalina, but something isn't ready, you know, not an Apple thing, but a vendor thing, one of the apps they rely on, a piece of software, it breaks their entire production process within that company. And that's critical, costs them a ton of money. So to prevent that, they take time, they validate, they delay those operating system updates. And when they're ready, then they roll them out globally to their entire team using Jamf Pro. 
two paths, two equally powerful ways you can really harness new operating systems from Apple. Now, of course, one of the best ways to learn about new operating systems from Apple, how we're managing them with Jamf, is at our user conference, JNUC, the Jamf Nation User Conference. We've been doing this annually for 10 years now, a decade of learning directly from Jamf and our partners. And this year was our biggest yet. This was a really exciting milestone for us with more than 2,000 Apple IT admins flying in to join us here. So I'll circle back on this later. Uh, for 10 years, it's been in Minneapolis, Minnesota, right in the center of the states. And uh, if you know where that is, you know it's very far north and very cold. Uh, we do have an exciting announcement, something a little bit warmer next fall. So keep an eye out for later in this deck. But I tee up JNUC because a lot of announcements that we'll talk about today, they really had their roots in JNUC a couple of weeks ago and actually further back in some Apple announcements before that. So I'll start with Dean. He's our CEO, of course, if you've seen Dean speak before, a very electric speaker. He was on stage at JNUC and said uh, part of his opening remarks was, uh, you know, I'm often asked by people in the market, will you go broader than Apple? Meaning, would you ever engineer a product to support something outside of the Apple ecosystem. And you know what I'm talking about, other platforms, non-Apple devices. Would Jamf ever consider that? And the answer has been for 17 going on 18 years now and continues to be no. We choose to go deeper with Apple. Now, that statement and that belief is why it's so exciting that for the first time, Apple actually joined us on stage and said something publicly for the first time that was a really big deal. Apple's been on our stage for many years. They've joined us at JNUC. They've been a part of our events. We love Apple as a partner. But for the first time publicly, they came out and said that since 2010, Apple has been a Jamf customer. In fact, Jeremy Butcher is uh, a leader of a product team over there at uh, Apple. And it was really great just to have Jeremy there to talk about this from the development standpoint. Every day, Jeremy is responsible for MDM, right? Building the mobile device management framework that we build our software on top of. So in a lot of ways, we have Jeremy and his teams to thank for what we're able to do to streamline your lives. And so Jeremy joined us, had this great quote, and uh, again, for the first time said, look, when Apple looks around at the marketplace and has to choose a solution, we choose Jamf. We were thrilled to see that, thrilled to hear that publicly. So uh, a great reminder to all of us that when Apple themselves needs to make a choice, they're choosing us. Now, again, a quick call out here for that questions box. If you've got questions as I move through this next section, we'll start to get a little bit deeper into the Apple ecosystem and a little more technical fire away. I've got plenty of time on the back end. We can move through that questions panel together. So type those out and send them in. Now, in 2019, Apple had a big year as usual with kind of two bookend events, right? One in the spring where they tee up something usually around a specific part of their business or a specific industry. And then in the fall, where they really almost always reveal new hardware. Now, right in the middle of that is WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Conference. Every year, Apple gets up on stage. You've seen Tim Cook on stage teeing up some of the great new things they're about to release to developers like us like Jamf, right? And they're saying, look, we're changing some things in the ecosystem so you can do more, so you can go deeper, so you can make things more streamlined for your customers. So I want to walk through each of these and talk about some significant changes we're seeing from Apple as it relates to 2019, but use that to tee up what we think is coming in 2020. Now, back in March, we have the Apple March event, and you can see kind of a theater stage light shining down on the Apple logo. Uh, that was very intentional, as all of Apple marketing is, because it was showtime. That was the tag of this event. And they were rolling out Apple TV+, Plus, of course, but Apple News+, Plus, Apple Arcade, some new services from the company, which I think re is really interesting in two contexts. One, you can see everything on this slide is really consumer-facing. So we're seeing this general shift in Apple's strategy at a corporate level that used to be almost entirely around hardware and software and the deep integration of those two parts of the business, right? That's how Apple wins. Deep, deep integration between hardware and software. 
But we saw this spring that that strategy is evolving. It's roping in this whole new paradigm of services and really elevating that to a new level within the company in a way we haven't seen before. Now, why is this important to us? We're IT admins. We're not managing Apple Arcade at scale, right? If I'm in a business that doesn't apply and if I'm in a school, I don't want kids on Apple Arcade or on any arcade. I want them learning, right? Well, this is critical because of the strategy shift that's taking place here. What we're seeing is services being elevated and as you'll see in a minute, being broadened into business one service at a time. We think that there might be something to this and we might see more in the future. So just hold this for a minute and in the 2020 section, uh, I'm going to circle back on this uh, specifically with Apple Music for Business. You'll start to see how Apple is changing. They're not just business to consumer with these services anymore. We might need to be a little more prepared than we think we have to be. Now, WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Conference, this is always a big event for Jamf and for you uh, by association because Apple uses this event to say, here's how the MDM spec will be changing in the next 6 to 12 months, right? It's typically a roadmap-centric presentation. And usually what they do is say, here are some things we have been building and why, and here's what we're teeing up for the next, you know, fall, winter, spring of what we'd like to build in the near future and what's coming specifically this fall. So we flew down, as we always do, a big contingent of jamps and said, what's going on? What do we need to be ready to build and support to make sure that day zero happens again this fall? We hit day zero. Here's what we had to support this year. New operating systems goes without saying, right? This will always be, I think, uh, a kind of a keynote of the Apple presentation at WWDC. Catalina was a big deal for a lot of reasons. You're seeing the expansion of some security features like activation lock. Uh, Catalina is a part of that, evolving that desktop class browsing and productivity experience to a new level. But I wanna call out the second item on that line, and that's iPad OS. You know, I think prior to this year, the iOS story was so all-encompassing between cell phones, iPhones specifically, and tablet, that it was really one story that we kind of felt could be two. And you saw that in the market in a really interesting way. The common question was, will iPad ever get Mac OS? Do we ever think that Mac OS could come to iPad? And the answer was always from Apple, no. We don't see that happening. Mac OS is a desktop class browsing experience or operating system experience iPad is something else. And so there wasn't real clarity until suddenly there was. And we found that iPad OS would be this purpose-built operating system for tablets, right? And so we've all seen this. Hopefully you've had some hands-on time now. It's the same code base. It's a fork of iOS 13. But you will start to see more and more specific solutions and features built specifically for iPad OS. Now I'm thinking of things like multi-touch gestures, bringing that desktop class browser onto iPad OS. That's a divergence from true iOS functionality. It's not a pure iOS play anymore. It's very closely aligned, but keep this in mind. As we head into 2020, this is a very strong signal from the Apple teams that they view tablets as a very specific use case. And I think to really put a point on it, a very specific pain point that they can solve better with its own dedicated operating system. So watch this, learn this stuff. If you have not had hands-on time yet with iPad OS, now is the time to find a demo device because 2020, we'll see an evolution of this story. I'm kind of teeing up something we'll touch on later in this deck, but keep that in mind. iOS 13, tvOS 13, of course, evolving those stories as well. We continue to see really strong adoption on those operating systems for two different reasons, tvOS, hospitality, and healthcare, massive use cases. And I might be speaking to those of you right now that are in those industries, consider how you're using them today or in some cases not yet adopting them. And that gap that you see between uh, patient rooms, waiting rooms, uh, doctor offices, things like that where you could be implementing tvOS devices. They really are a game changer, and we've got some great apps to help make that even more streamlined than ever. So take a look at that. For iOS 13, though, this is something that is evolving that mobility story, specifically around how 
we've seen for years people buy, purchase, and bring their own iOS device, iPhone specifically, to the workplace, right? And this, I think, for a lot of us as admins has been a bit of a headache. You look around and you say, I can control very well the devices that I am buying as an organization, right? I will buy and provision things and give them to you. They're managed, they're supervised, they're secure. But if you're bringing something into my walled garden, onto the company network or accessing email, uh, maybe a shared file drive, you know the frustration that can cause because suddenly you're caught and you need to both empower your end users but protect corporate interests. Well, with user enrollment, the second bullet point on this slide, that story got a lot easier this year. That is effectively BYOD, bring your own device, the next generation. So in the old way of doing this, in fact, it's still live in Jamf Pro, personal device profiles or PDP or personal device management, that was one way of doing it that was not great at protecting the privacy of the end user. With user enrollment and the proliferation, just the massive adoption of iOS devices among everybody, you're always buying your own iPhone, you can really empower people to bring that device to work in a way that is secure for the organization but private for that end user. Now the final promise we got at WWDC that I'll call out here was enrollment customization. And this was extending that native Apple experience to new heights, right? So we've seen the Apple setup experience from login, power on, to becoming productive. That's a very streamlined and controlled environment, right? You know that experience as an admin and you want your user to feel familiar and guided in that process. Again, with the end goal being fast productivity. Well, with enrollment customization, we can add in things like welcome messages, rich media directly to that workflow. Very powerful stuff. So we've seen the spring, we've seen the summer, and now we're rolling into fall. And every year, I think this is where it reaches a fever pitch. Anyone that works with Apple devices knows this will dominate the news cycle for at least a couple of weeks, right? Leading up to the event, the event itself, and then following the event, all of the launches of new operating systems and hardware. Really big deal. So this shouldn't come as a surprise. New iPhones, new watch, new iPad. There was a lot of great hardware this fall. But there was also that services update. And this continues to be a guiding principle for Apple heading into the new year. We saw services launch and they're now in the marketplace. So one example of this that I think is very interesting for us is Apple Music for Business. So Previously, that was a B2C offering only, right? Business to consumer. If I wanted streaming music, I would buy it with my own dollars and listen throughout my day. But if I'm a business and maybe I want that in a lobby or around my supermarket or just around the office to provide white noise or background, what do I do? And the old answer was, there's not a great way to do this, right? It's not a business class offering. It wasn't built for you. Now it is, and I think that shift of Apple seeing that pain, building and launching a solution to address that pain for businesses and making it a services-based offering is very telling. So again, we're reading the tea leaves here, looking ahead to 2020. Don't be shocked if you see more services specifically targeting business and enterprise class problems. As we head into the spring and specifically into the summer of 2020, that's what I'm looking for. And really all ears perked up, kind of gathering any information we can. I would not be shocked if we see an expansion of Apple is a services company like we saw this year in 2019, but with new enterprise grade offerings specifically for business. So what does 2020 look like? Well, of course, the caveat that I am pulling out the crystal ball here, nobody knows, but I'm going to take some educated guesses based on what we saw in Apple corporate strategy this year and where we think that could lead in 2020. Some themes that we already see and how they'll play out in the new year. And again, a call out for that questions panel. If you've got questions or you just want more clarification on any of this, fire off a question now and I'll get to it in about 10 minutes. So some high level trends here, but we'll just dive right into each of them one by one, beginning with ecosystem management, specifically UEM. Now, 
UEM is a term that's been around in our industry for five or plus years, right? Maybe six or seven at this point. And it's unified endpoint management. It's this idea that with one tool, I can manage any kind of endpoint in the market. Doesn't matter what it is, I can put it into my you know, one solution and manage it effectively. And the problem is unified endpoint management boils all devices down to their lowest common denominator. Now, if you're dealing with non-Apple devices and users that are not demanding Apple, that's a problem, but it's not going to sink the ship. It's a pain point, but it won't end the effort. But with Apple specifically, with users that know iPhone from outside of the workplace and demand Apple in the workplace or just prefer it, they know that Apple experience. And if you boil that down to the lowest common denominator, and strip away that Apple value, that's a world of hurt waiting to happen. That really puts the brakes on why Apple is differentiated in the market. So it ignores real market trends. There is a significant burden of training in a tech stack there. But I want to call out management by ecosystem. And this is something we've talked about at Jamf for a couple of years now. But I'd like to validate this with somebody outside of our company. Not me, not Jamf, but Forrester Research, this global research organization that just this year, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, said this quote. The vast majority of companies are still using multiple management platforms with less than 5% actually using unified endpoint management. That should be striking to anyone working in enterprise or medium to large size education. Because for years, we've had this promise that UEM will come and make this all easier, make all of our problems go away, because we can manage everything centrally with a single pane of glass. But the reality is, look, I'm an IT admin out there with multiple platforms around my organization. This might be a very real picture for you. You might look and say, we've got mostly Apple, we've got some Windows, a few random Google devices, whatever. I can't manage all of this effectively because there are fundamental differences between these devices. You're absolutely right. And that's the real core challenge with a centric approach around UEM. You take all of these platforms, desktop, tablet, phone displays, and the ecosystems in which they live, and you wrap them into a single paradigm. Very difficult to get anything to be uniform across all of these ecosystems. So for years, Jamf has said, look, the better way to do this, and the market is now bearing this out, is Jamf for Apple. We are the gold standard in managing Apple. We have been for 17 years. Microsoft for Windows devices and Google for Google devices. This makes the most sense because each provider listed here deeply understands that ecosystem and is best positioned to support the unique strengths of each. You're not stripping them away to try to force everything into a single peg or a single hole. Now, another trend we're seeing is, of course, Apple in the enterprise. I want to bring in some quotes here from IBM, but before we do... Uh, just to tee that up, let's take a look at a few smaller trends we've seen. Managed Apple IDs has been a thing in the market for a long time, but it's coming to business. In fact, it is in business now. And certain features like syncing notes for businesses across Managed Apple IDs make this much more attractive than it used to be. First of all, it's available, which was not always true. But second of all, you're seeing iterative features added to Managed Apple IDs for business, which make this, again, a little bit of a wind flag or a wind sock for us, saying Apple's taking the enterprise seriously. And to be serious in the enterprise, they need a managed ID offering. Apple ID is the center of their ecosystem for so many things. That is a great way to kind of take their temperature on if they're taking it seriously. And I'm pleased to say they very much are. Now, Project Catalyst is something I want to call out as well very briefly. This was unveiled at WWDC in the summer. And it's an internal project, a technical improvement at Apple that will make it much easier for vendors, frankly like Jamf, but more importantly for application vendors to build apps for iOS and macOS systems. Rather than two separate distinct builds, Project Catalyst helps uh, you build once and deploy to both ecosystems. Now, that's a big deal, not because any of you are dying for an easier development pipeline but because you're likely dying for a certain application that's not available on a specific platform. Maybe something is on Mac, 
but it's not on iOS yet or on iPadOS yet. And that's a problem for your end user. Project Catalyst makes this easier for the vendors that you rely on. And so as you look around and you've got users coming to you saying, I've got this Windows device, I'd like to switch, but I'm not sure I've got all the application support I need, that gets you closer. Now I promised IBM, here is IBM, specifically Fletcher Previn, Chief Information Officer at IBM. Fletcher has been gracious and a great partner of Jamf for years to join us at the Jamf Nation User Conference. He was back this year with, I think, his strongest presentation ever. He brought some data that is just striking to me as a, an observer outside of IBM, that macOS users are 17% less likely to leave IBM. Think about how high up that challenge goes in an organization like yours. Retention, the war for talent, finding the best people and keeping them around. The conversation around which device to give, give them is no longer around what's cheapest or even what do they prefer, but it's now a conversation around employee retention. I, I just give uh, Fletcher so many kudos for this data because that is a game changer and I want you to take this back to your organization. They also at IBM see that Windows users are five times more likely to need on-site support, which is very costly and very time intensive. They can't solve the issues over the phone like they can with Mac OS users or just not have issues at all, right? So again, a very interesting stat. Now I want to circle back on something that I teed up actually on this webinar 12 months ago. And that's the great migration of Windows 7 users. 417 million Windows 7 devices still in the wild today. That's current information. So 417 million devices that in about three weeks, support will end on January 14th, 2020. That's coming right after the holiday season. We're going to get back, have about 14 uh, days or you know maybe 10 business days to really address this before support ends for all Windows 7 devices globally. And I'm saying this with a bit of edge in my voice because if you have Windows 7 devices in your organization, now is the time to address that. Take some time this week even and dig in because end of life is coming. Now, is there paid support available? Yes, it's gonna run you 50 to $200 per device to extend that support beyond January 14th. So. Uh, this is a massive seismic shift, and it really goes back to that question of when support ends, what do I do? Well, Dean Hager again on stage at JNUC, this is the core mission in many ways of why we build what we build. That if you have someone in your company that does prefer Mac, they should be empowered to choose Mac, and this could even say Apple in general. We don't need the world to all use Apple devices. In fact, it can be detrimental to give an Apple device to somebody that prefers Windows. But that choice program mindset is an empowering thing for you and for your company. If somebody prefers Apple, empower them to use it and protect your corporation at the same time. So a few things here to end, and then we're going to jump into questions. Plenty of time for Q&A if you'd like to stick around. We are right on the money at 2.30, so if you'd like to sign off as well, now is a great time to head to your next meeting if you'd like to, but I will take live Q&A. Jamf Pro, we've got some great updates that really began back at WWDC. We've now shipped user enrollment, shipped enrollment customization, and Google Secure LDAP, a massive integration for us. If you're using Google Directory Services, Google Identity, or G Suite, you can now rely or pull that data into Jamf Pro to build smart groups, to assign devices, scope things uh, directly in Jamf Pro with that directory data. Take a look at that. It's a really big deal for anyone using Google. I also want to give props to all of the folks at Microsoft that have helped build this integration for three years running. Now, it used to be called Microsoft Intune. That name has changed. It's now Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And it used to be called uh, uh, conditional access, but it's now called device compliance. So again, you'll see some new terminology, but that same great integration still living on within the product. I want to give a shout out as well to Paul on the uh, Office 365 team. He was on stage with us at JNUC debuting this integration. This is such a massive deal for anyone out there 
that has Office 365 deployed in your environment. You don't need to manually grab installers, package things up anymore. This will be available to configure directly within the Jamf Pro UI with a single configuration profile. That's coming in a couple of weeks, so get through the holidays, check back in. We'll have a release coming very soon. I can't wait to get this out in the wild, and we will have documentation from us and from Microsoft to go along with that launch. So keep your eyes open. That's a, a very big launch for us. Excited there. And the final thing I'll say is uh, Jamf Pro and Jamf Connect are now integrated. I want to give props to the Connect team because we've never had a first-party integration between Jamf Pro and our identity product, Jamf Connect, before now. And this is a really significant integration. So if you've got identity needs and management needs, now is the time to take a look at that. But what do I do next? Maybe you're brand new. I'm not sure where to go after the webinar here today. Well, first of all, head to Jamf.com. Get in touch, talk to our teams, wherever you are on the journey, we'd love to dialogue with you there. But the second thing is, of course, get on Jamf Nation, jamfnation.com. It's free. You do not need to be a customer. Just hop on, create an account, and start interacting with your peers, more than 100,000 fellow Apple IT admins. I'd also encourage you to mark your calendar and join us at JNUC 2020. If you loved the slides from this year, IBM, SAP, Microsoft, our CEO, our executive team, our product team, including me, and you want that FaceTime to just talk with us and hear about Roadmap, we were there this year, we'll be there again next year in a sunnier location. So uh, pack that swimsuit or that beach towel and join us in uh, sunny San Diego. We can't wait. It's going to be a really fun year for our 11th JNUC in 2020. So I'll take questions now, but I want to end with this quote from John. This was last year. His vision is to make that tech experience simpler for the guest. I love this because it feels like John could work for Jamf. Well, folks, it has been 40 minutes jam-packed with content. Uh, I hope you found this as valuable as I have. I always love these year-end webinars, a chance to, again, break out that crystal ball, look ahead, and make some predictions for the coming 12 months. Uh, again, thank you for your time as well. The year end, the calendar year end is always a packed time with projects and things to get done around the holidays. So thank you for carving out 40 minutes with, uh, with us here today. On behalf of the Global Jamf team, I always just like to end by saying thank you for being a part of the Jamf family. And if you're not yet, go to Jamf.com, get in touch. We'd love to talk more. Have a great day.